Chairperson, sir, I hope I'm audible. I was told it was 25 minutes, so I'll try and squeeze it. So I made the talk for 25 minutes. Anyway, so when first Banthi Sabu, I hope he's here, he's not here, he first gave me this topic, in insulin resistance protective. At that time, I was having problems with my eye. So I said, Bansi, can you read it? What have you given me? You are asking me to say that insulin resistance is protective. Well, yes, exactly so. Okay, I'll say, okay, that's a challenge. Let me find out. This is contrary to what we are thinking, what we know. So, the usual definition we know, insulin resistance means you have increased insulin synthesis as opposed to the blood glucose level. So the preliminary diagnostic criterion is high levels of plasma insulin in relation to glucose levels. Simple. Clinically, how do we make out a person walks into a clinic, who is insulin resistant? Tummy size, waist circumference, that's the best clue. So if we look at the data for, this is men and women, a waist circumference less than 95 and so on and so forth and for women this is the waist circumference. So if you see cardiovascular death, MI, all cause death, lower your waist circumference, better it is, higher your waist circumference more. So in fact, the highest tercile will have 29% increased risk of cardiovascular death. So insulin resistance, waist circumference, waist circumference death. So insulin resistance is equal to more deaths. That is what we know. Okay. Now, you see, this is, we know about the thrifty hypothesis, thrifty gene hypothesis. Ancient humans, we had a starvation and feast cycle. When we were not eating, we had sodium and water loss. Energy consumption was more because we are hunting. And that led to activation of all of this and increased sodium reabsorption by the kidney. And insulin resistance, driving the blood glucose away from other organs into the brain, which does not have insulin resistance. So keeping the brain active, that was the idea. But that has backfired now. Current obesogenic environment, we get insulin resistance, hypertension, obesity, so on and so forth. But actually, in the same person, say for example me, Morning time, I'll have a different insulin resistance. Night time, I will have a different insulin resistance. When I'm working, when I'm active, when I'm sitting, there's insulin resistance difference. Even in, the, even in separate organs, there is difference in the insulin resistance. It is not the same everywhere from head to toe. So, if you see here, the different issues differ in their dependence on insulin, like skeletal muscles, liver, fat cells, abdominal viscera they are the most insulin dependent, hence they are exposed to this insulin resistance problem, if you look at a problem or benefit, whichever. But brain, red cells and placenta, they are insulin independent. So what advantage does the placenta get by being, not being insulin resistant? So high insulin resistance means I'm not giving glucose to this group, muscles, liver, fat cells, heart. I'm not giving glucose to them. I'm diverting the glucose away from these areas to the insulin independent, which is the brain, red cells, and placenta. So the main work of the body is to keep the brain alive and active. So make the other organs resistant, divert all the glucose to the brain and the red cells and the placenta. Other organs like that is the kidneys, the nerves. So I'll come to that, the importance of this. So, conditions of starving, insulin resistance makes more glucose available to the brain. Now, in the, during pregnancy, the maternal insulin resistance, higher the resistance of the mother, more glucose gets diverted into the placenta. That was the original theory that Matter, mothers will become a bit resistant because starvation, you're exposed to starvation, they are being resistant, blood goes into the placenta, which is insulin independent, no resistance. So babies get the glucose. But now, if the mothers become too much insulin resistant, lot of glucose in the blood, all of it goes to the baby, you get large babies. So diabetic mothers, increase in fetal weight was independent of maternal weight gain. So the insulin resistance for the mothers is good. But too much, not good. 
just appropriate. Now, the common link, these are the conditions, pregnancy, uh, overnutrition, PCOS, these all are associated with the insulin resistance. What, which one is the common link? Where do we say, ah, this is the bit which is causing it? So, currently, it is thought of that the mitochondri mitochondrial superoxide, this is the common link. If that is increased, you get insulin resistance. This is the current theory. Now, if you see here, this is the crucial slide, which my, the rest of my talk will be focused on this. If you have excess of food, obese, and you don't exercise, or suppose we go into this, if you exercise and you have calorie restriction, so less of food, more of exercise, ATP demand is high. When this happens, this is low. When this is low, you get more of activation by the AMPK pathway. When you get more activation of the AMPK pathway, this activates the GLUT4, and there is increased glucose uptake of that cell. However, if there is nutrient excess or high levels of sugar, obesity, and you don't exercise, then the mitochondrial superoxide gets increased, and that through undefined mechanism will inhibit the GLUT4 and reduce the glucose uptake. So you can clearly see, reduce the extra nutrition and exercise. You go by this pathway, you don't do that, high blood glucose, less exercise, you go by this pathway, automatically the cell becomes insulin resistant. You will not take the extra glucose. So this is a very interesting article, just come out last month, and if you want to really read, very good insight, and my talk is based a lot on this. So if you see, in the heart, there's a concept called glucolipotoxicity. When we are eating, we have extra blood, blood glucose is high, free fatty acid is low. The heart will then feed on the glucose. Okay, you have given glucose, heart will feed on the glucose. When you're not eating, the blood glucose drops, the free fatty acids goes up, starvation. So the heart will now change and begin to work, feed on the free fatty acid. So this is nature's mechanism of balance. But what happens in diabetes? You get both increased glucose, increased free fatty acid. So then, heart is bombarded with two different sources of energy, and this causes problems. What does the body do to counteract that? It causes insulin resistance to stop this bit. See, it prevents, tries to prevent the extra glucose from getting into the heart by making the heart cell insulin resistant. So that the heart is exposed to this excess, but not both of them. And what we are trying to do, if I give insulin, I am forcing the insulin resistance. I'm not doing anything to the insulin resistance, I'm forcing this extra glucose to go into the heart. So high levels of sugar, all that going into the heart. So what happens in the cell, this is normal, you get glucose, you get free fatty acid. But when you, insulin resistance is preventing excess of this to come in. But when you get both together, with glucose is converted into acute glycosidin end products, and the free fatty acids causes other problems. So this is called glucolipotoxicity. Is it borne out by, this is a new concept which is coming up, you see? So is it borne out by uh, clinical studies? So there was one study <coughs> just two years ago, 18 patients with type 2 diabetes, failure of oral glucose therapy, they were put on insulin substitution. Now they tried to check what is the lipid content of the heart when you start the insulin therapy, and what happens after about six months. And what they found, this is the liver, this is the heart, and this is the myocardial uh, lipid content. Immediately after starting the insulin, it actually went up, and after, later on, it came down. So that's a thought, you see? So the initial slide which I told you, nutrient excess, not exercising, you're going down insulin resistance, we are trying to prevent that, and you're causing excess accumulation of the glucolipotoxicity. So, and another thing which is increasing coming up is endothelial insulin resistance. Because blood vessels carry all the hormones. It supplies all the organs. So they're most exposed to all the chemicals. 
So the endothelial insulin resistance becomes a very important factor. And this is another crucial side. So endothelial insulin signaling, two pathways it will go through. One, good pathway, PI3K signaling, it will produce nitrous oxide, vasodilatation, antithrombotic. Bad pathway, MAPK, it will be prothrombotic. So you have got two, one which is good, one which is bad. Okay, two ways. Now, I am giving extra nutrition, mean extra glucose, and I'm not exercising. What happens is the endothelial cell will try to protect itself from damage. So what it will do, it, is, it will try to cause insulin resistance. But what actually happens is the insulin resistance is here in the good pathway. So the signaling goes to the bad pathway. So there is selective insulin resistance here. And if now all these very high levels of glucose we try to force into the cell, it will go all through this pathway. So if you say insulin therapy is successful when the blood sugar levels are quite well normalized, when we say it is unsuccessful, in spite of high insulin, blood sugar levels are high, then we have problem because all the signaling will go through here and that will lead to endothelial dysfunction. So that is the theory now. So if you look at the trials of conventional and intensive therapy in the UK PDS, you know there was no difference in the cardiovascular outcome, but in the metformin arm there was. Look at the weight gain in the UK PDS, not much difference. Look at the ACCORD trial where there were intensive treatment, insulin use was quite high, weight gain was more. So extra nutrition plus less of activity, weight gain, that had higher cardiovascular outcome, which my previous speaker has just said was not attributed just to hypoglycemia. VADT, same. Look, look at the amount of insulin used plus the weight gain. So high insulin, high weight gain, and if the blood sugar stays high, then you have got problems. If you look at the insulin treatment versus conventional treatment, Digami 1, initially, it showed some benefit. But it was a short three-month follow-up. Look at the Digami 2. The insulin use was much more. The weight gain was much more. And actually, there was no benefit, cardiovascular outcome-wise. Bari 2D, I'll come to that. So in a follow-up of Digami 2, actually, insulin therapy from the time of hospital discharge was associated with increased risk of composite of death, reinfarction, or stroke. So it seemed to be detrimental on paper. If you come to the Bari 2D, where they use insulin sensitizer versus insulin provider, insulin use and sulfonylureas, there was no difference in the outcome. It was not worse in the one which has insulin sensitizer. So whenever intensive use of insulin was associated with a lot of weight gain, all the cardiovascular and outcome mortality seemed to be affected. Because I said, that signaling is going through the wrong pathway, not what we want. If you look at the look-ahead trial, where they use lifestyle intervention through weight loss. So intensive lifestyle intervention, they only achieved an HbA1c reduction of 0.2. They showed that overall, non-significant nevertheless, but all the aspects were reduced. So 15% reduction of um, um, the uh, death rate, myocardial infarction, fetal myocardial infarction, and 20% reduction in heart failure. Not any medicine, lifestyle, weight loss. However, it was not statistically significant. Why? Because at the end of eight years, there was only a difference of 2.5% between the weight loss in the two arms. You need greater weight loss, greater nutrient reduction. So if you see here, the cells, the nerves, the kidney, the eyes, they are not affected by the insulin resistance. What is affected is here, the heart, liver, muscles. So if you cause insulin resistance, blood glucose goes into here. So if you have treatment just to lower the blood glucose, you will have benefit of these. But no benefit of these. 
That is what all the trials have shown. Insulin, sulfonylurea, if you give, that will lower the blood glucose benefit this, but no benefit, sometimes worsening. So, clinician has the choice. Treat the hyperglycemia with enough insulin to override it. That way you will reduce this, but you will increase, increase insulin-induced metabolic stress to the insulin-responsive tissues. What is the other alternative? Other alternative is, I take off the load of nutrients. I remove the glucose out. Only, not push it into the cell. I take it out, or not allow it to be absorbed. That will benefit this plus this. So therefore, you see, bariatric surgeries, alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors. So that is, the, that is why the SGLT2 companies are getting a bit excited. They said it is not just glucose lowering. It is lowering the nutrient. You see my point? So all this should theoretically at least cause better cardiovascular outcome as opposed to insulin and sulfonylurea. So, nutrient offloading. You're not just allowing the glucose to enter. So then, you, you should expect some better cardiovascular outcome. But you are, you are pushing the glucose inside by overriding the resistance, high-dose insulin, sulfonylurea, you may, there is a theoretical risk of causing this. So, Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, we are all aware of this top NRDDM trial, where they use alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, significant reduction of cardiovascular outcomes. In the meta-analysis of alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, significant reduction of cardiovascular outcome. No, all the other drugs haven't been able to show. We have intentional, this is the data, um, follow-up of 12-year mortality follow-up of 5,000 individuals over a period of 12 years. So those who intentionally lost weight, what happened to them? And they found those who lost 20 to 29 pounds, that is between 10 to 15 kilograms of weight, they had the maximum benefit in mortality. Not only all cause, but cardiovascular mortality. So what I'm suggesting here, or what this study suggests here, is take out this excess glucose out. If you take this excess glucose out, the insulin signaling will occur like this. How can you take this out? Exercise, medications, which will not allow the excess glucose to enter in the first place or take it out very quickly. Weight loss through exercise or medications. So, what they propose, and this is my second last slide, that caution needs to be exercised in using very high dose insulin in overweight or obese individuals if they are unable to achieve improvements in lifestyle. If used, it should not be used with very aggressive glycemic targets, and it should be used in combination with other agents that have nutrient offloading mechanisms of action. So this is my last slide, which shows, so suppose this is C-peptide level. So low means not making any insulin. So if a person has no insulin, then, uh, insulin therapy will be beneficial to this person. Obese person not making any insulin, it will, be many, it will still be beneficial. Obese person making a lot of insulin already and blood sugar levels are high, then insulin therapy, as I showed you through these pathways, might potentially cause harm. Now, ladies and gentlemen, these are not my thoughts. This is the current thinking process which is happening to partly explain why have all the trials not found any benefit in the cardiovascular outcomes, but there is benefit in the microvascular outcomes. So we, we look forward to the trials which offload the glucose to see what happens to those trials. Thank you very much.